friends. What use is it to get up there and have all the world's accolades, to have all the world's wealth, and when you die, you can't take it with you, and one of your foolish children or nephew or whatever go and spend that in frivolity and, and, and riotous living and destroy what you attempted to build. You can't take it with you, and guess what? You've got to give an accounting to God. You wanted the accolades of men, friend. The only accolade you need is the accolades of God because at the end of the day, or might I say at the end of your life, his accolade is the only one that matters. And so we must, we must get our thinking correct. Don't live for the world, live for Christ. If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in the Father's glory with his holy angels. Friends, Jesus calls us out from the crowd. And though salvation for us is free, it costs us our life. Our lives are given in exchange. Jesus gave his life in exchange for ours. He took our sin. He, we get his righteousness. Yours is an exchanged life, not for your living out, but for the living out of his glory with the power that he provides. Did you get that? In order to follow Christ, one must deny himself. Let me break it down. If this present life is the most important thing to you, you will do everything you can to protect it. You see, folks, by the grace of God, we're going to get right up into your worldview, right up into how you think, because let me tell you, how you think controls how you live, and how you live is seen. It is seen in your lack of commitment to Christ. It's seen in your inability to give towards what's important to Christ. It's seen in your ability to tithe. It's seen in your ability to, to uh, in offerings. It's seen in your ability to be about service. It's seen in your ability to win others for Christ. It's seen, friends. It's seen. Everybody can see where your loyalties to Christ lie. It's seen in the way that you live. That's why, friends, we are going after your heart. What do you believe? Where is Christ in your life? Who is he? Whose life is your life? Who does it belong to? Who is the boss of you? If this present world and its accolades are important to you, you will do anything that you will not do anything that might endanger your life, your health, or your comfort. God had Christians in, in two centuries ago telling them they go into India. When William Carey understood he was going to India, you know what he meant? You know what he understood? Death sentence. Do you get it, friends? Now, not all of us are called to extend our lives in death like that, but God ought to know he. We ought to let God know our lives are his to take as he pleases. For 99% of us, that's life. But thank God for William Carey. South India knows the faith because of William Carey and others like him. Africa is 50% Christian because persons gave up their comfort zones to take the message of the gospel there. You see, friends, when your life is your own, nobody benefits, not even you. You don't benefit eternally when your life is your own. But when you give it to God, when you die to self, and God gets a hold of that life, watch out, world. Watch out. Look what God can do with a life wholly committed unto him. That's why Christ's command is so clear. To follow him and be effective for his kingdom, you have to deny yourself. You have to deny yourself. You have to. No man can serve two masters. You can't serve yourself in Christ. You can't do it. Everything he says is a battle. The Bible tells you the flesh is hostile to God. God says to his servant Jonah, Jonah, go to such and such a place. What? Not them. Nasty, dirty, stinking Assyrians who put hell on my country. Fella gone the other way. Listen, why? Why? Because Christ is not master over Jonah's life. Jonah, folks, listen to this. You could actually be quote unquote serving the Lord and not be in a right relationship with him. Help me. Help me, God. Help me, God. Friends, there is no no in God's kingdom when God calls you to service. I know, and I know what it is to get cut skin when you say so. Now, God don't cut your skin bad, bad, like some of these behemoth parents cut with every syllable. And I tell 
you, you know, the, the discipline of God is a whole lot more gentle than that. But boy, you don't like to be under his chastisement. But let me not go to discipline because I don't want you feeling like the Lord forcing you to give up your will. No, no, no. If any man, choice is yours. Choice is yours. If you do not die to this world's false system of belief that give you comfort and ego satisfaction, Christ will never have the benefit of your life. You've got to let self go because self will destroy you and probably everybody else within your sphere of influence. One commentator put it this way, when it comes to serving the Lord, you may risk death, but you will not fear it because you know that Jesus will raise you to eternal life. Nothing material can compensate for the loss of eternal life. Nothing material. Jesus' disciples are not to use their lives on earth for their own pleasure. They should spend their lives serving God and people. Spend your life, friends, serving God and people. Underline that. Spend your life. Don't waste your life. Spend it. Spend it serving God and his people. Continuing. He should be willing to, we should be willing to lose our lives for the sake of the gospel. Not because our lives are useless, but because nothing, not even life itself, can compare to what we gain with Christ. You know, every so often I reflect back on my life and I'm telling you, God saved me at the right time. Because friends, I'm here to tell you, I was about to bust loose. I was about to. I mean, I was a gentleman, 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 but boy, woman looked good. And I was ready. And, and, but God stopped me. And when I look back at my life, I wonder, Though I would not have wanted to father a child out of wedlock, what was going to be my guarantee? Though I, I know I was never going to get married because from a broken home like I was from, marriage ain't an option when you, when, you, when you just, when that really washes over you. And I said, what would my life have become? What a mess I would have made with my life. But oh, I am so grateful to friends who said, his life is too important to let him waste it in his own sin. And they challenged me. And they worked with me. And I came to my sense by God's enablement and said, yes, Lord. And I just say, yes, Lord. I wasn't prepared to be a Sunday go to meet and Christian. I said, you know what, Lord? Here it all is. All of it. All of it. Here it is. I lay it on the line. And God say, that's what I wanted. And I believe he's made something a little old me to try and do some work for the kingdom. And I want to encourage all of us, the stories in this Congregation of Legions, I look down, I know your stories, and I say, thanks be to God that God came along, tapped you on the shoulder and said, I want your life. And you responded by the grace of God and told him, yes, here it is, all of it. And God is glorified in our lives. Friends, spend your life on, for the things of God. Spend it. Don't waste it. Don't waste it. You know when you have money in your pocket, you could waste it, or you could feel like you spend that wisely. That was an investment. You know, who do we know what I'm talking about? When, you know when you wasted money, you, you know when you, you spent money on a wise investment. Invest your my life. Spend your life in the things that matter. Jesus wants us to choose to follow him rather than to lead a life of sin and self-satisfaction. He wants us to stop trying to control our destiny and let him direct us. This makes good sense because as a creator, Christ knows better than we do what real life is about. He asks for submission, not self-hatred. He asks us only to lose our self-centered determination to be in charge. He let him be in charge. Oh, friends, for all the stops and turns he's put on my life, and I thought where, what I was about to do, I could only say, thank you, Jesus. All of us could be stubborn and hard-headed, but I, I thank God that there were times I was not stubborn and hard-headed, and I said yes. He's a good God. And I know you know what I'm talking about because you've experienced that yourself. The question, who is the owner of your life? If you say Christ, can you honestly say that you die to yourself daily? You see, friends, I know the human nature. I have one. And we fight against the advancement of, uh, uh, of God and his authority in our life. We want him to have just a little bit because we know better than him what we want to do with our life. We know better than him how we could manage our lives. And so we just want to take that little corner piece right there. That, you know, give me enough of you that, that I could say I got you. But friends, that won't do. He knows what he wants to do with our lives. He knows how we can make it better than we could ever conceive of. The question is, are you actively denying the world that control you before you came to Christ? 
for the gospel's sake. Friends, if your non-Christian friends can see no difference, and your excuse is, well, you know, um, rile with the Romans, you're, you're, you're like the Romans. When you were the Jew, no, 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 friends. If your friends can't see that Christ made a difference in your life, and you're doing everything you did before, and, and they can't see a difference, friends, I got to question your theology. You ain't changed. Thank you very much. Are you losing your life for Christ? In John 12, 24 through 26, Jesus elaborates on the point of dying to self when he says, I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, that seed, it dies, it, it, it's dead, it's under the ground. You, you, you don't see it. it. It's died. But actually it's begun to live. It only remains a seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. The man who loves his life will lose it while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant will be also. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Here it is. Here in the Gospel of John, Jesus goes even further and reveals that the real value of dying to yourself by comparing the process to a kernel of wheat dying buried deep in the ground. The only way that one kernel can reproduce itself so that many are fed is to die to self. That kernel... One seed, one seed of any plant can populate this earth. Do you get that? If the whole world was destroyed and someone somewhere managed to hold on to one orange seed, one orange seed, one, one, they would be able to take that seed and over time, Create orchards and orchards and orchards and orchards and orchards and orchards and orchards, and orchards where before there was only wasteland. Why? Because within that one seed is millions and millions and millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of oranges. And I'm telling you, within your one little weak and enfeebled life is life everlasting for others if you would only surrender your life to Christ. It is a home that can be transformed if you allow the Spirit of God to have his way. I'm telling you that one enfeebled, seemingly useless life given into the hands of the Lord has great power to affect and transform everything around you. L die to self, friends. Die to self. And let Christ be raised to life in you that you may win and change and transform your world for the kingdom's sake die to self and then of course last week I showed you how he goes a little further than that he says remember Lot's wife who couldn't let go of, of um, Sodom and ended up losing her life in the blast radius that fell on that city I helped us to understand the attitude of, of uh, Paul who says that he had learned the value of not putting confidence in his flesh because he had gotten caught up in what he was as a Jew he was uh, a Pharisee of Pharisees, as to the law, faultless. And he said that these things just gave him his sense of status, his sense of, I have arrived. And friends, that's what the world's accolades do. They puff us up so that we can't see Christ. Friends, all of Paul's accolades and his desire to be at the top of the food chain in the Pharisees automatically cause him to dismiss Jesus. You get it? And when we are trying to get at the top of the food chain in our societies, we miss what God would have us to be and do because we're chasing the wrong things. And God would have us to be following after Christ. Paul says he gives them all off. He says, whatever was to my profit, I now consider lost for the sake of Christ. He wants to know Christ, not the accolades of this world, so he's given them all up. He considers them rubbish, he says. Uh, he considers everything lost compared to the greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, his Lord. Friends, the word of God is true and you must accept it. If you are going to become the person as God has made you to be, then we must allow this work of transformation to be manifest within us. The Apostle John, speaking to this issue, writes in 1 John 2, 15 through 16, do not love the world. That's where it all begins. Do not love the world or anything in it. 
If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but from the world. Friends, this is a direct observation of Adam and Eve. Direct. Direct. They had a relationship with God. But the devil focused their eyes on something in this world. And what happened? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. Listen, you shall not die. For God knows the day you eat of this, you shall be like God, knowing good from evil. It has the ability to make you wise as God. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. And Adam and Eve went down like ten pence. And the same strategy continues to work on believers and non-believers alike. The lust of the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes will keep anybody from full-blown discipleship, full blown loyalty to Jesus Christ. Be careful what your eyes lust for. Be careful what your flesh lusts after. Be careful that you don't need the, the, the accolades of this world, the boastful pride of life. Look what I have. Look, look what I got. Look, look what my abilities has brought about. Friends, these are enemies of your flesh and enemies of your ongoing discipleship. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. Do not love this world nor the things in this world. Learn to love Christ. Fix your gaze on him. Brothers and sisters, if you're going to love the world, you're going to love the world or you're going to love God, one or the other, not both. The Bible is clear. No man can serve two masters. No man can love two masters. A man can say, yeah, I could love two women. Oh, really? Oh, really? One of them women is feeling your neglect. And the other one ain't so certain of your love either, because why you still got the next one? No man can love two women. No man can serve two masters. That poor stupid fella can't even serve them two women. But he, the, the pride of life got him. Tell his friends, boy, I got two women. I got, huh? <laughs> Pastor Dan is right. When he's his one, he don't know what the next one doing. What does that song say? <laughs> right. Who's making love to your old lady while you're out there making love? Exactly. I want to ask you a question, friends. Do you resent being a Christian? Do you resent that being a Christian is keeping you from some goal? It's a hard card now. Do you resent that being a Christian is keeping you from some goal? Let me give you a freeing word. That goal is therefore ungodly. If you believe being a Christian is keeping you from some goal you always had in life, that's your first indication from the Spirit. That's an ungodly goal. Because my Bible says no good thing will, would God withhold from those who love him, for those who are serving him. So if that's a good thing, God is not withholding that from you. Watch the idols of the heart. Watch the idols of the heart, the things that motivate us and control us. put it to you that your soul will never know true satisfaction until you determine that you can absolutely trust God with your life. But this is a problem, as I said last week. We're born with a sinful nature. The Bible says um, that our flesh is hostile to the things of God. Friends, when Jesus comes a-calling, your flesh comes a-crawling. Your flesh does not want to bend its knee. It does not want to say yes to God. Because it knows God's ways are pure, and there's some impurity we want to keep. It knows that God is an exacting judge, and there's some things we don't want to let go of. Each of us must make a choice. There's a choice to be made. Will you believe your own sinful human nature? That holding on to things dies and does not give? Wastes and does not spend? Do you want to hold on to what your human nature says? Or will you trust the one who says, I have come that you may have life? And not a boring life, not a stale life, not a useless life. I have come that you may have life 
And you have that more abundantly, exceedingly so. Overflowing is the idea. God will give you an overflowing life. That's what he wants to do. Live for self and all its distorted passions or live for God. Words of Jesus could not be any clearer. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for me and for the sake of the gospel will keep it. We cannot be ashamed of him, he says. If we're ashamed of him, he will be ashamed of us in the uh, heavenly realms with the Father's glory and his angels present. And you thinking, boy, whew, I live for the Lord and, and uh, you know, I did my own little thing and so forth. And, uh, and here it is, you, you, you're there, hey, Jesus! Yeah. <laughs> But boy, and that, that's the hand signal now. Jesus says, depart from me, for I never knew you. I was never Lord of your heart. I was never Lord of your life. I, I never had any authority in your life. You allowed me here and there to be able to, to, to say this or that, but I never had the authority in your life. I don't know you. I don't know you. I'm ashamed of you and your so-called witness. I call on you today to make a decision. If Jesus is who he says he is, then commit to serving him with all of your heart. Don't be half-hearted or lukewarm, believer. Learn to resist the pull and status of the world. Ask God to help you die to the world's glitz and glamour and to sin's attraction. Here's some steps to achieving transformation into Christ-likeness. The first thing you need to do is recognize that Christ has called you to be a disciple not merely a Christian or church goer. Do you realize that, friends? Jesus called the disciples to him on the mountain and said this. All power and authority has been given unto me. Go and make church goers. Go out there and make worshipers. Go out there and hold some services. Go out there and, 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 and you know, have a raucously good time in the name of the Lord. No. Go and make disciples. Period. Full stop. If Grace Community Church is not making disciples, it's wasting time. Wasting time. And I'm wasting your time. And brothers and sisters, our theme for this year is helping you and us to be transformed. Transformation for reformation. We will be the change that God wants to see. Friend, that's the only way it's going, that's the only way ministries are going to take place. That's the only way that the ministries of God are going to be financed. It's the only way that this wicked little country of ours is going to be challenged. Why? Because we are the salt rubbed into society saying it don't go like that. So understand, you are being called to transformation. Not church going. God has called us together with this leadership. We, we understand he's called us together to chart a course to make disciples for the Lord Jesus Christ. Anything else is a waste of time. We want to spend our leadership wisely while it's in our hands. Because it ain't always going to be in our hands. One, I could lose it prematurely by not being God's man, and so could this leadership. Two, old age can catch up with me. Brother Trico's father, Tracy, always used to say, from the time you're born, death, death running after you. And he said, the lady he got, he felt death was right on his heels. He couldn't duck him. <laughs> you, know, you, could, you could do all your movements, but death right on there. You feel death breathing on your neck. And so, while we have the stewardship, discipleship is everything. We want to help the, 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 the work of Christ to be fully manifest. It'll show up in the way that we do church and do life and live our homes and, and, and the way that we think about everything. It is a transformation of the mind and the heart and a transformation of the home and everything. But it begins right here. What are you? Are you merely a churchgoer? Or are you stepping forward to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? Friends, if you're going to be a churchgoer, this could be a hard year for you. But if you're understanding the call to be a disciple, 
you are going to blossom and grow and bloom and ministry is going to take place in a powerful way in Grace Community Church. I can say by the authority of God, if we are committed to being disciples and not merely churchgoers. Amen? Amen. So we begin by recognizing that Christ has called us to be disciples, not merely Christian or churchgoers. Two, we must recognize the call to being Christian is a call to die to yourself. Friends, you may not get it today, you may not get it next week or next month, but I believe that somewhere along the line you're going to get it, what dying to self for you looks like. You see, because dying to self looks different for all of us. I cannot mandate how you die to yourself in this pulpit because we're all different. Let me see if I can explain what I mean. To deny to oneself is a deeply personal experience. Peter had to give up his fishing in order to walk with Christ. I never had to give up fishing. Paul had to give up his pride and his Jewishness. Means nothing to me. The rich young ruler had to give up his money. I don't have none. <laughs> Jeremiah had to give up the thought of marriage. Thank you, Jesus, I'm married. <laughs> Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. The believer is not made is not made over into the image of Christ through a man-imposed or church-imposed method, but rather through a personal encounter with God in Christ, who at some point will say to you, in order to really follow me, you must surrender your idols daily, as no one can serve two masters, for he will love one and hate the other. Now, friends, the idol may be a personal dream. We have those, don't we? In order for God to really grab your heart, oh friends, listen to me. There's some personal dreams you might have to give up. There's a relationship you might have to let go of. Friends, listen to me. Discipleship is costly. But all oh, the benefits of being in the will and in the plan and in the purposes of God. There is nothing greater. You don't want to gain the whole world and lose your very own soul. The idol he asks for may be a personal dream. It might be family pride. You know, when I was called a minister, you have to understand, in my family, you don't take money from no one. You understand? And right away, mother, father, and brother, when I told them that I felt this call to ministry, that was the first word out of all of their mouths. And I was not talking to them together. I spoke with them individually. That's just not a way. That's not the way we do things. I had to let go of family pride. I had to let go of it. Pastor Rex, the same thing. His father asked him, did you, you lost your natural mind? This man is the, uh, at 18, is the principal, first time probably in Bahamian history, black man, principal of a school in Abaco. And this boy talking fool about Jesus calling him to give that up to serve him. The man lost his natural mind. No. Discipleship is happening. Discipleship is happening. Now, aren't you grateful that Oral Rex Ricardo Major heard the call of God, <laughs> surrendered his life? Let me show you something. Salvation, salvation. Alan Lee. Now, watch the trickle down effect. None of them save, because they ain't save. That's by the grace of God. A save. I save. Got it? That one man's dying to self and personal dreams. I'm here by the grace of God. Because he said yes to God, no to the world. And look at the world's accolades. You, my boy, you are so smart. You are so ahead. You are so awesome that we put in a black boy in charge of a white school in Abaco. That's how, what, what an offering he had laid at his feet. But like Moses, he despised what the world had to give if it meant knowing Christ better. I wish I could get an amen in this big old church. Good friend, Cyril Pete. Cyril, I don't know why I don't ask you the voice talk. 
Cyril Pete had to give up his dreams for college because God said to him, no, my plan for you is here. You will stay here to build grace. I could tell you over the years. I can't, no, I can't begin to tell you over the years what Cyril Pete has been to me and many of the families here in this church. But he had to die to a dream, a personal dream. Money had already been set aside for it. His plan was ready to go. But he hears God's call and he says, yes, Lord. Friends, personal discipleship is costly. Oh, but the rewards. The rewards that we all reap and benefit from because someone has said yes to God. Thirdly, ask God to identify the idols in your heart and give you the grace and faith to abandon them on a daily basis if necessary. You see, because some things don't die easy. Uh, there was a time in my giving up and letting go. Uh, it seemed like every time I gave up and let go, it was still right back there, and I had to give up and let go again. Some things die hard, like a root in the heart. Can't just that. You, you can't. You got to get the top, the whole top root out. You can't leave no root left. Paul says, "I have been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live. The fr friends of here's the issue. Christ may have been crucified for us, but it's us who live." Paul says, no, 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 I have been crucified with him, and I have died, and I who live, I live in Christ, and the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the one who loved me and gave himself up for me. And so, we must ask God to search us and find the idols and give the idols over to him. And friends, I can't, say, I can't tell you what your idol is, but God knows, and he's able to put his finger right on it. Four, consider yourself a soldier in active duty under the authority of God. Friend, this is where it starts. Now, this is where it gets intensely practical beyond, beyond uh, your personal encounter with God and him saying, give up your idols. Here's where it gets intensely practical. You must consider yourself a soldier in active duty. You're under the Lord's orders, not anybody else's. Not anybody else's. You're under the Lord's order and the Lord's authority. And because you're in active duty, you do not get caught up in non-soldier activities that distract you from your mission. Here's what the Apostle Paul says in 2 Timothy 2, 1 through 5. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. Also, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not win the prize unless he competes according to the rules. Got it? The way to keep yourself free of getting pulled in the wrong things is to remember that you are a soldier of Christ, beloved. You belong to him and you are under orders to please him. There are your choices. Please the God of this world, the devil, or please Jesus, your commanding officer. Sometimes the choices are not necessarily between good and bad, but good and not necessarily good for you. Here are a few questions you can ask yourself to aid in determining what you should be involved in. Will, this, will being in this activity dull your senses? Will being in this activity dull your spiritual senses? Will it make you less effective for his service? <clears throat> Will it keep you distracted? Will it keep you unfocused? Too unalert to perceive the enemy's schemes in your life and in others? Too consumed to hear God's trumpet calls to arms against the enemy? Friends, if those things are happening, I put it to you that that's something God is calling you to give up, let go of. Five, allow God to help you determine what are some encum encumbrances to you. Uh, Hebrews 12, 1 through 2, as we close, says, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangled us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising its shame, and has sat down on the right hand of the throne of God. So we must ask ourselves a question. What are the encumbrances? What things are holding us back? You see, the Christian life involves hard work. It requires us to give up whatever endangers our relationship with God, to run patiently and to struggle against sin with the power of the Holy Spirit. To live effectively, we must, we must keep our eyes on Jesus, beloved. We will stumble if we look away from him or stare at ourselves or at the circumstances surrounding us, as Peter did when he walked on the water. We should be running for Christ, not ourselves. We must always keep him in sight. Six, allow God to help you determine what are some weights. What are some weights? Is unforgiveness of those who hurt you, is that a weight? Anger towards God, yourself or others? Disappointment in a relationship? Baggage from your past? 
Staying in any of these states will cripple your ability to run the Christian life effectively. Friends, even past abuse, a woman struggling with past abuse who does not surrender that to God and reveal, receive healing, that is a weight that will hinder her from running. And so we must let go of victories, successes, joys, let it all go, fixing our eyes on Jesus. And thirdly, as you actively transform your thinking, let God chip away whatever does not look like Christ. You see, friends, the story is told of an ele elementary school class that went to the studio of a famous sculptor. As the children entered in, they had to pass by the sculpture of a very ferocious and realistic-looking realistic lion. One of the students said to, it, to the sculptor, Hey, mister, how were you able to make such a realistic-looking lion? And here's what the sculptor said. It was easy. I took a large block of marble, then simply chipped away everything that didn't look like a lion. In the same way, beloved, we are all like a block of marble. But when we willingly place ourselves in the master's hands with a conviction that we have to change and die to self, the Holy Spirit can successfully chip away at anything that does not look like Jesus. Shall we pray? Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, I've attempted to be faithful with your word and your teaching, putting it before myself and before this congregation of believers and saints. I've used the words of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who has called us into relationship with himself. Lord Jesus, your call is to discipleship. You want to own our lives completely. And yet we find ourselves unwilling to fully surrender and finally let go. Help us in these moments, Lord, and in the moments to come, <coughs> to surrender ourselves completely to your service and to your will. The musicians will come now, and I will return with our closing prayer and commitment. Let's make it our prayer. Let's stand as we offer this prayer. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. been singing the song as a congregation, but for those that want to make that a prayer right now, I'd like for you to raise your hand along with me, that this would be indeed be your prayer, that the Spirit of God would fall on you and chip away whatever doesn't look like Jesus and transform you from a mess into a masterpiece, that he would help you as you deny self, that you would find victory to overcome in your life, and Christ would be raised up fully as Lord in your life. Lord, behold the hands. Behold those who have responded to your word. Behold those, Lord, who say, yes, here I am. Like Isaiah, we recognize that we are guilty. We recognize that sin has been taking more 
uh, of an effect in our lives than your authority has. And so like Isaiah, we need your cleansing. We need you to remove the sin of our disobedience and cause us to be righteous in your sight. Oh Lord, we say, we choose today to deny all that we are and to live to the praise of the glory of serving Christ. Help us to know daily as you would visit us this week by our invitation and raised hand. Help us to know what we need to give up that we might know you more. Help us to know what the weights and the encumbrance that keep us from running the race well with you. And help us, Lord, to determine to fix our eyes on Jesus Christ, our Master and Savior. And help us, Lord, to be filled by your Holy Spirit that we may live lives empowered to the praise of your glory. We offer ourselves to you. Change us and fill us, we ask in Christ's name. Amen and amen. The Lord be with you. The service is over, but your service to the Lord continues. Go and tell somebody, I'm serving the Lord Jesus Christ, denying self to live for his glory. Are you? We want to invite our guests to join us upstairs for moments of light refreshments, or banquet as it's called, and we trust we'll see you all again next week, the Lord providing the enablement. The Lord bless you. <clears throat>